Welcome to the Schumacher Center for a new economics conversations. My name is Jody Evans and I'm the co-founder of Code Pink, Women for Peace. I'm here on the west coast of Turtle Island in the lands of the Tongva tribe. I'm also a member of the Schumacher board and was in the audience to be educated and inspired by the lectures of both Winona and Leah who join us in conversation again today in this virtual form. I can already feel your enthusiasm in the chat box, which is exciting. So we'll be in this conversation for a while, um, but we also really want to have your questions. So please put them in the chat or the question and answer. The Schumacher lectures have featured some of the best thinker activists over the past four decades. But I feel both these women are cultivating the future of justice, regeneration, and peace I long for. And they both do it with their hands and their stories while healing history into a relational humanity of nourishing abundance. Winona's lecture was, um, one was in 1993, it was our 13th, and then in 2017, she gave the 37th. And Leah gave her our 38th lecture um, in 2018. Winona LaDuke is an environmentalist, economist, teacher, and writer. And I have to note also the first BIPOC woman to run as vice presidential nominee for her party. On the land of her ancestors, Winona is focusing on relocalizing the economy cooperating with other tribes to meet basic needs regionally through sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, and fiber production from hemp farming that will not only provide food, energy, textiles, and other supplies needed by her community, but also provide meaningful, healthful, non-toxic jobs. Not only is she creating a sustainable model at home to be shared with others, but she is also an international leader in indigenous rights and environmental justice. As the executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Agency Advocacy Organization, Honor the Earth, which she co-founded in 1993, Winona has national and global influence. And Leah Penniman is a farmer, educator, author, and food sovereignty activist. She is a leader in our national conversation about land, race, and liberation. Leah has over 20 years of experience as a soul steward and food sovereignty activist, having worked at the Food Project, the Farm School, Many Hands Organics Farms, and with farmers internationally in Ghana, Haiti, and Mexico. The mission of her organization, Soul Fire Farm, is to reclaim our inherent right to belong to the earth and for black and brown people to have agency in the food system. At Soulfire Farm, which she co-founded in 2011, black, Latinx, Native American, and Asian growers participate in agricultural training workshops that focus on healing people as well as the land. She is an inspiring activist globally as her work is healing and life-giving while nourishing collectivism and social change. So Winona, I'll start with you. As you gave the earliest lecture about coming home and living in harmony, then 25 years later, after teaching us about cannibal economics, you gave us the green path home to happiness and a beautiful life. What do you wanna add as we lay our paths forward out of the war economy into the local peace economy? Anin, Anin, Nindaway Mugget, and Tokolo, my relatives, happy to be here with you today. I'm uh, calling in from northern Minnesota. I'm actually up in Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Most of you wouldn't know that, but this is where they make like really cool agricultural equipment. So us little hemp farmers, we had to come over and see what they're making. And so I've been all morning at this mill trying to see how to turn hemp into fiber. That's what I'm doing. Um, so that's kind of the present note, uh, but happy to be and honored to be here with you and, uh, you know, grateful always for the work of the Schumacher Society. So, you know, since three years ago, you know, on one hand, I could say, looks like nobody listened, things are not getting better. Um, I think we could say that fairly. 
Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of things like indigenous people said, like, don't pick a fight with mother nature, you won't win. Yeah, said that one a couple times too. Um, so having said that, you know, I, uh, you know, we've continued on our path and I, I do have a few pictures to show um, kind of of where we're at. And I'm gonna try this share screen option here. And um, give me a minute here. Then it's gonna, oh, no, it doesn't have you. Where did I go here? It's not this one. Hmm. Just a minute. Oh, well, there we go. Um, so what I wanna say is, is that uh, my neck of the woods, this art I probably showed you went up. This is a water protector. You know, this is before we were all wearing masks too. And we brought these out of Standing Rock, but this is an indigenous woman and she's in Northern Minnesota where we're generally invisible, but she's uh, uh, about 30 feet wide and 20, 40 feet tall or something. She's just huge, downtown Duluth. So I'm a water protector where I live. Got Wawiagama Ground Lake in the middle of the Whitehurst Reservation. And this is kind of this moment, which is uh, some art from our area. His name is Roy Thomas. And uh, on uh, this piece is called We're All in the Same Boat, which kind can of is see, what I think. Can you share your screen? Uh, we can't see the screen. Oh, so I'm just having a nice visit with myself <laughs> about my screens. Huh. Okay, let me just try that again. Hold on. I have to be the, uh, the person who. Uh, learns how to do their PowerPoint again. Hmm. We got uh, not showing. I see it says that. Now I we just need you to go to your PowerPoint. Okay, we try that again. Can you see it now? There we go. Okay. All right. So um this is the art from our um as I was saying, this is our uh, water protector and she's in downtown Duluth. And I think she was put up in 2016 or 2017. This is where I live, Gawawi Gamug, um, that's Round Lake on the White Earth Federation. And this art is the art I was talking about and this is called We're All in the Same Boat, which you know pretty much is now. And you know, I wanna start by talking about our wild rice because um, indigenous people live where the wild things are, about 4% of the world's population, about 80% of the world's biodiversity. And in this moment and in all moments, we need to protect life, you know, and that's, uh, this is what wild rice looks like. It grows on our lakes and rivers. And seven years after our battle with the Everidge Corporation, they still have no pipeline and we still have our rice. But this is our biggest rice lake and that, uh, that whole field is rice, which we, you know, parch and we bring in. And so all of that has continued. And this year it was interesting because in the time of COVID, we harvested rice, but our people did not sell it. They kept it. Because um, everybody in our territory wants to be sure that they have food security. And so it was hard to get rice to sell this year. It's an interesting moment. But, you know, in a transition, you know, part of what we, we all know is that, um, you know, I really like what Erin Dottie Roy says when she refers to pandemic as portal. And she says, you know, in this moment, you know, in the history of the world, pandemics have changed societies. This one is no different. You know, because the fact is, is that we're doing stuff now that we would have never done, like wearing them face masks, right? They were made them illegal in North Dakota, or they tried to, and then here they are, they're all wearing face masks now, right? And they all had to stay home, and we couldn't fly around. Jody and I used to fly around on our brooms around the world. Now we fly on our Zoom, right, Jody? That's how we fly. I fly my Zoom, not my broom. But my point is, is that, you know, we are forced to change and we wouldn't have changed. We would have kept doing our monkey business until something closed us down. And, you know, there's a lot of things to be said about the origin of COVID, but I noted that it started with a bat, you know, that's the origin of COVID, of, of the, you know, of the virus. And, and I think about that in indigenous people, we have these times in our world and we, you know, there's like, there's a lot of teachings, like little guys can do big stuff. That's one of our teachings, like in our creation story and in a lot of our stories, we talk about how these like, you know, little meat creatures might be big. And that's this one, that's this lesson right now. It's like, don't mess with stuff. That little guy that you don't think nothing of might have a big impact on you, you know? So that's why we need to protect our biodiversity. But what Erin Dotty Roy says is she says that societies are forced to change. And she says, a pandi she refers to a pandemic as a portal, an opportunity to move from one world into the next. And she said, asks the question, do we want to bring our prejudice, our avarice, our dirty skies, our data banks, our dirty rivers? Do we want to carry that through or we want to go through clean? 
we want to go through clean. And that is really this moment because that's what we want to do is we want to have this moment where we see the tumultuous nature of the world around us. You know, never in my life did I think those Columbus statues would fall. Never in my life, you know, but statues are falling. Icons are falling. You know, we have obviously disasters of political proportions. You know, on all sides of us, you have a political crisis, a health crisis, and an economic crisis of major proportions. My strategy and my thinking is just keep pushing because we have a social movement that is transforming. And a lot of us have been doing this for a long time, you know? And what we noticed in this time is many things, but one of the main things we noticed is that big systems fail. Big agricultural systems crumble. You know, they cannot adapt. There was all this arguments about the economy of scale while E.F. Schumacher was saying small is beautiful. Everybody else was saying go big, economies of scale. What well, turns out those systems cannot transform in crisis because they're too big. And this last week I was picking corn. This is, you know, some of the crises ahead of us. And I was picking corn and I was showing my grandchildren. And I said, look, look at our corn. We're looking at our corn and some's little and some's big and different sizes. I said, corn's smart because it's got a, a, it's, it's a really smart plant, but when it makes GMO, it's not smart anymore. It's more like a robot. It can't adapt and it can't change the way our plants do. So I just wanna say kind of in the last vestiges of last stages of if it, Windigo capitalism, here's the tar sands. You know what, we're facing the single largest tar sands pipeline in North America, Enbridge's line three, still fighting them. You know, and the tar sands ec economy is crumbling. I heard Alberta's trying to figure out how to make plastics now. That's what I was listening to. That's their latest great plan. Let's just make plastics, recycled plastics. So I was like, man, you guys need a good plan, huh? But my point is, is that, is that, you know, as we look at this monstrosity, you know, and we're, Minnesota is still fighting. We're fighting to the end over this pipeline. And I said, yes, there's some jobs, but those jobs, you know, these pipelines are like the Auschwitz, you know, it's like the Auschwitz it's of the gas chambers of the environment. You don't want to work in the gas chambers. You don't want to do that. So that's the end of this economy. It's time to really move on. And this is our battle. So all of that territory is where our biodiversity remains. All of our rice, all of our maple sugar, all of our lakes, you know, and this is, this is our battle. And this is what we look like on the ground. You know, our people are strong. And I'm pitching this to y'all because, you know, it is possible that by next spring, they will try to push ahead. And then we will need you, you to come visit us and be with our women and stand on these front lines and face these guys. Because this equipment is already in northern Minnesota. They have this equipment on the right, this is the MRAP. It is parked <laughs> really close to the line. There's two of them in these small towns that don't need MRAPs really, you know. So I'm interested in this just transition. You know, here of course is AOC talking about the Green New Deal. And I'm interested in what a just transition looks like. I refer to this as like the sitting bull plan. You know, thinking about what that great leader said, he said, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And I think about that a lot because, you know, they had the Marshall Plan. I don't know who Marshall was, but he was an important guy. And he, so he got that plan named after him, but we need a, a plan of scale. And we need a plan of scale. And what I know is what y'all know is that, is that it is likely that the solutions to the problems that have been created will not be found in the paradigm which created them, you know? it's time to check those bags and move on you know so this is our work i have a couple of pieces i'm just going to share this one here is our eighth fire solar so about four years ago looking at how cold we were in the winter time we realized that there was this equipment out there called solar thermal panels and those solar thermal panels can reduce your heating bill in your house by about 20 percent this is on a south facing wall and so you know minnesota like the dakotas is cold as heck in the winter time but it's still sunny and so what if you could put a south facing in this heating thing on the south facing wall, save 20, 30% of your heating bill, just get it from solar. So we, uh, we found this equipment, we bought the technology and we manufacture these on the White Earth Reservation now. They are uh, available nationally. And this is a really good solution to the, to the you know, in, in the next economy, we have to be efficient. In the next economy, we have to still still have to stay warm. And so we need to get, you know, the next economy is not based on consumption. It's based on survival. And so this is part of that strategy is uh, building the solar. And then a lot of local solar, you know, because I think one of the slides I was shown before, but, you know, in a time of climate change, fact is, is that uh, power goes out. 
power goes out more and more when in time of climate change. I mean, just ask uh, Jody over there in California, you know, the PG&E, all of that stuff. These, these grids are going down. And so if you want to build, take care of your community, you got to put up this stuff. You got to put up solar. You got to get, you know, keep it. So this is 20 kilowatts of solar for my tribal school in the Pine Point Village. We put up with some support of some donors and you know, I think Jody and, and some of her friends were even part of helping us put that up, you know? And so I just want to say like, you can make these transitions. And I always point this out because my reservation, you know, really like you look at us and you say, those guys are screwed. They will never get anything, but we are a plucky bunch. I mean, I think that Trump came up here and talked about having good genes, but I don't think he was talking about us, <laughs> but we're tough, you know, and we're, and uh, we're making this stuff because we're survival. And then this is um, some of our art. We decided, you know, I had a new one I forgot to put in, but I could show later, but we've been muraling up these old housing projects to make them beautiful. Because, you know, a 50 year old housing project that's all full of Indian people and it's like, so we put solar panels on them and we paint them. And uh, so we're rocking through this housing project. And then this is what I'm working on now. And as I told you, I came up to look for some hemp processing equipment. So I refer to hemp as the new green revolution. And I'm a pro cannabis, legalization across the board for all kinds of reasons you know obviously medicinal all kind of reasons and just my tribe i mean just to give an example of my tribe i did some because i'm an economist and all nosy i started serving people and asking like who smoked herb and who doesn't smoke herb and talking to people who sold herb because of course you know in my small community you could figure that out pretty good i asked them and it turns out my tribe price spends about four million dollars a year buying herb who figure from like, you know, people who are bringing it in from California, or I don't know where they're bringing it in from. And I was like, well, what if we just capped that and grew it ourselves? You know, what if we didn't buy it someplace else? And so my tribe did just pass a medical, you know, and so we'll see, but you know, in that medical, they should allow people to grow themselves because we have so many health ailments up here. We have a lot of fibromyalgia and lupus, and we have all kinds of things that, you know, low income women of color are susceptible to. You know, and so these are good things, but my work is in fiber hemp. And so what I grow is this stuff. And um, I'll have a new picture next week because we're about to go tackle this field, but all those guys are still in my hemp field. This is what we grow is this eight foot tall fiber hemp. And I've been at this for five years. I got a permit from the state of Minnesota to grow. This is the 2019, 18 crop, 2018 crop off the tribal field. And so what I've been trying to figure out is how to turn that stuff into something that you can make textiles out of, or turn that into something you can make uh, hempcrete out of, or turn that into something that you can make insulation out of, or, you know, turn that into something. And so we have been on this odyssey and I've been around the country and talked to all kinds of people. And, you know, it's kind of when you talk at the cannabis industry, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and everybody's going to save you and they got all this money and it's like a bunch of like, it's a lot of snake oil salesmen that you don't want to be involved with. And so but because we're a very persistent bunch, um, we're figuring out these processes. And right now I'm up here looking at this equipment that I think will turn, will, will be our processing equipment. But stay tuned, stay tuned. And we'll see, you know, that'll be value added, you know, but then we got to mill it. So the, what I'm trying to point out is, is that if you want to make a cool economy in this country, you got to do a structural adjustment. And that structural adjustment must do, deal with size because big is not good. You know, size matters. Appropriately scaled is what you want. You need regional, you need energy self-reliance, you need to build regional economies and bioregional economies, and then you need to exercise trade between those economies. So this year, you know, Winona's Hemp and Anishinaabe Agriculture, we provided seeds to Red Lake and Sisseton and, and Cheyenne River and uh, Navajo, Oneida, and uh, Rosebud Reservations. We provided seeds to all these tribes in our region and beyond to see what we could learn about growing hemp again. And uh, so we're in the process of taking that hemp and then it's 90%, uh, well, 80% uh, of, that, of that inside is called herd. And that's what you can make hempcrete out of. And then the outside fiber is what you wanna do for textiles. But part of my point is, is that in the deconstruction of American industrialization, you know, I'm not opposed to industrialization or I'm not sure if I want the term, but you know, it's just, what are we doing? You know, because what we did is they disestablished and de 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 you know, de took apart the textile industry and offshored it. We offshored everything. 
And what you need to do is you need to reshore things at an appropriate scale in an appropriate place. So this is what you do with hemp. You know, if you want it in your cotton, you know, I'm wearing a cotton shirt here, which of course, you know, takes 5,000 gallons of water and had all kinds of agricultural chemicals on it. You know, but hemp doesn't need that. And it doesn't need 25% uh, of the pesticide uses in cotton. And then this uh, tree, similarly, hemp is really the answer. And then this is what was getting at today, that stuff in the middle is hemp herd. And so I was sitting there with these farm guys who are running stuff through a hammer mill, and then they're really special equipment. And so I'm gonna take that hemp herd, and this weekend we have our first hemp creep workshop. And so I'm gonna see if this hemp herd can be used for hemp creep, because I got 21 acres of it. And I think that I can make some buildings out of it. That's what I'm trying to see. And this is my crop of corn, one of my crops of corn. And during COVID, what happened to me? I don't know if it'll happen to you, but I got, I got, I got um, all those kids basically live with me. <laughs> now they all quarantined with me. So I'm running basically this farm, and I have uh, half girls and half boys on two different farms, and we are processing all this corn. And this is our traditional corn varieties, which you can see they're really short to the ground. And uh, some of those ears are just like a knee off the ground, if that, on your ankle. And all of that corn adapted for climate change. And so I'm interested in climate change resilient and post-petroleum agriculture. And that's what we're working on in my community with a lot of fun, a lot of horses, I must say, and a lot of youth. So this was a couple of days ago in a cornfield that actually an Amish friend of ours grew. Um, we grew our own, but we've been working, we quarantined with the Amish and last couple of slides is that, you know, I'm looking at this regional economy. So in the midst of this pitched battle, you know, it's not just against Enbridge and their, and, their, and their oil pipeline. It's also against these big mining projects they want to put into the boundary waters. And this is the end of Windigo economics, the last stages of, of capitalism. When you're at this point where you're like 2%, 1% ore, you know, basically, there's nothing there in that copper and they make so much waste, you know, and the same thing as fracking or this oil, it's like the end. You just need to move on, you know, and I, the governor, you know, I've many times I write letters to the governor or op-eds and start to be, and I'm like, you need to just move to the Green New Deal instead of digging up the last ore in the boundary waters and having a civil war over a pipeline project from Canada, you know, that's going to produce 24 jobs. I got 24 jobs in my nonprofits right now. We employ more people than Enbridge will employ in the end. My point is, is that rebuild an economy that makes sense. So this is the Port of Duluth, the Port of Duluth, and in the Port of Duluth, which is the furthest inland port, those are wind turbine parts coming from Germany. And my point is, is that if you want to build an economy that makes sense in this country, you better build some of this stuff here. And it's great that we import everything, but we import everything that we need. And now is the time to rebuild an economy that makes some sense. And that is what the Green New Deal and the Just Transition look like. So, that's the, sh the short, but I wanna, um, again, thank you for this opportunity to give a little update on our, on our work on, on WIDER. Wow, well, Winona, you're busy as always. <laughs> and that's a very happy chat um, going on of people super engaged and excited that you're both here. So Leah, you taught us how to decolonize and re-indigenize our relationship to land, and you gave an amazing history lesson that I still remember about how when the farmers were stolen and enslaved, when they left Africa, they had seeds woven in their hair. And your telling of history um, it itself is healing and grounding and nourishing. So I'm just wondering if we could get a little more history and, and learn what you've been doing since your last lecture. Of course, and thank you. I'm deeply honored to be here. Hi to those who just joined. My name is Leah Henneman, joining from Soul Fire Farm on occupied Mohegan and Haudenosaunee territory, upstate New York. And my pronouns are Lee, she, and Aye. And my ancestors come from the Homi region, West Africa, indigenous Taino in what is now the Caribbean islands, as well as Europe. And I am really excited and honored to get to talk to you about the troubled history, honestly, that we have in relationship to land and food and also what we at Soul Fire Farm and in these networks of Black, Indigenous and people of color, uh, land lovers are trying to do about it and how you can engage. So in eight short introductory minutes, I will start by calling in our ancestors, especially those ancestral grandmothers who 
gathered up their okra, malokia, levant, cotton, and other seeds that they'd been saving for generations and braided them into their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships. You know, they stashed away their Amara kale, their gourd, their sorrel, their basil, their tamarinds, and cola in their tresses because the seed was their most precious legacy. And they believed against impossible odds that there would be a future of tilling and reaping the earth. And they believed that we, their descendants, would exist to receive and honor that gift and carry it forward. But of course, it wasn't just the physical seeds that our ancestors braided. They also braided their ecosystemic and cultural knowledge, the wisdom of sharing the land, not owning the land, such as the Hausa farm co-op system of the Krobo people, who are my direct ancestors. Uh, they braided the wisdom of sharing labor and wealth outside of a wage economy, such as the Dokwe worker co-ops and the Susu credit unions of my ancestors, the Dahomey people. Right? They braided the wisdom of caring for the sacred earth, such as the dark earth composts of Ghana, the raised beds of the Ovambo people, and the polycultures of Nigeria. So much so that you can take a soil core in some of these communities and by the depth of the compost tell the age of the community. There is that level of ethos of how we all don't rape soil, but we add to soil. Right? But when my ancestors, when our ancestors arrived here on this continent, they tragically encountered a very different system in the colonized Americas relating to land and food. Uh, here, you know, land wasn't shared, it was stolen, it was privatized and authorized by the white Christian doctrine of discovery. Settlers perpetuate, perpetuated genocide against indigenous people, murdering millions of human beings and displacing survivors stealing the land, which is still stolen land that many of us are on right now. Um, our African ancestors learned that even when they tried to own their land according to those colonial rules, they were punished. Um, despite the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule after emancipation, black farmers did purchase nearly 16 million acres of land by 1910, almost all of which is gone. And it's gone in part because the Klan, the white caps and other white supremacist groups lynched black landowners for the audacity of leaving the plantation and sharecropping, killing over 4,000 people whose names we know. Right? And our ancestors learned that even the federal government, who's supposed to protect property rights, right? that's the constitution, did not want black and brown people to own land. And the US Department of Agriculture systematically discriminated against black farmers, leading to foreclosures, evictions, and massive land loss. Which brings us to where we are today, where approximately 98% of the arable land in this country um, is white owned, which is more racially skewed than ever. Right? And, he, and here in this country, our ancestors found that just as land was not respected, labor was not respected, it was not honored, and instead it was exploited. You know, millions of agricultural experts were kidnapped from their homes across Africa and forced into bondage, building the multi-trillion dollar agricultural industry and the foundation of wealth in this capitalist nation. And even after chattel slavery officially ended, the exploitation of labor morphed into new forms like convict leasing. So Southerners created laws called the Black Codes, which criminalized loitering and unemployment, filling the prisons with Black people who were rented back to the plantation, a system which continues to this day. You think of who is fighting the fires, who is picking the crops, right? Oftentimes unpaid uh, people who are enslaved through the criminal injustice system. And of course, those who were not forced onto the plantation through incarceration were often trapped on the plantation as sharecroppers in a perpetual cycle of debt and poverty. So, and this continues, right? Just as the land is still stolen and needs to be rematriated, farm workers are still not protected by basic labor laws and don't have the right in this country to a day off. Farm workers do not have a right to collective bargaining, a minimum wage if they work on a small farm or other basic human protections. And approximately 85% of the farm labor that's done in this country is done by people of color, mostly Latinx, Hispanic people born outside of the so-called borders of the so-called United States, right? So being a farm owner is among the whitest professions in the U.S., but being a farm laborer is among the brownest. And then we look at the earth, right? So we get here and, and the land is not shared. The workers are not respected and the earth is also not honored. It's about extracting. And industrial agriculture within its first generation of being here on this continent actually destroyed 50% of the organic matter in the soil, which was the, if you look at the history of anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you see the first big blip uh, with the tilling of the Great Plains in the 1800s. So this was the beginning of anthropogenic climate change 
and the destabilization of biodiversity. But despite this, right, despite the heartbreak, the terror that our ancestors experienced and, and that our people continue to experience, there were those in every generation who remembered the seeds that were braided in our ancestors' hair and, and inherited and carried on that wisdom. So concepts like cooperative land ownership and cooperative labor were remembered by Fannie Lou Hamer in creating Freedom Farm in Mississippi uh, with other sharecroppers and by the Sharads in creating the first ever community land trust in Georgia, thinking about how do we take our indigenous ways of sharing land and fit them into white man's law. Right? right relationship with land was remembered by George Washington Carver, one of the founders of regenerative agriculture in modern times, and Booker T. Watley, one of the progenitors of the farm to table movement and diversified small firms. And they spread the word about caring for soil and community through the first ever extension agency, which was out of Tuskegee University and inspired a whole generation of black organic farmers in the late 1800s, like two whole generations before Rodale, who's often credited, uh, but really repackaged these indigenous technologies, right? Uh, right, right relationship with one another was remembered by the Black Panther Party who fed 20,000 children a day free breakfast, catalyzing free school uh, food programs, and by the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and Land Loss Prevention Project and many others who continued the fight for farmers and farm workers who are struggling to save their land. So when I started farming as a teenager, now almost 25 years ago, you know, like so many, I had a dream, like one day I won't have to be a farm laborer, I'll be able to have my own, right, farm. And started to wonder how could this farm honor the legacy of the seeds? Like what is my duty to carry on what my ancestors have passed down? And we decided that our mission at Soul Fire Farm when we opened it in 2010 was to reclaim our ancestral belonging to the lands and to do our part to end racism and exploitation in the food system. So what we're doing, we're trying to regenerate these 80 acres of uh, Mohican territory through Afro-Indigenous farming and forestry practices. And the harvest of this land, which is you know, polyculture and silvopasture and perennials and carbon sequestration, right? the harvest of this land is going at low and no cost to the doorsteps of people impacted by food apartheid and state violence. So people who have an incarcerated loved one, refugees, immigrants, right? We are doing what we can to equip this next generation of black and brown farmers, the returning generation, those folks whose grandparents and great grandparents fled the violence, uh, uh, the land-based violence. And, and we're now realizing we left a piece of our, our souls, our culture behind that needs to be re reclaimed. And so this returning generation is coming for training programs and mentorship and connection to resources and, and so forth to get started. And, and the land has really been a tool for healing this trauma of centuries of land-based oppression because you know, the earth is the ultimate composter. So we come here, we put our bare feet on the land, we do the work of growing this food, and she's just soaking that trauma out into the ground and giving it back to us as hope. Right? With the buildings that we build here, it's, it's solar, it's um, cob, it's straw bale, it's you know, using local renewable resources to build highly energy, efficient, highly durable, high, beautiful buildings with, you know, hands crafted relief coming out of the cob that reminds you of birds and sunshine. So we're, we're surrounded by beauty. Um, we said, well, how do we practice what we preach around cooperative land ownership? So we, we put the land into a housing co-op and through our friendship with the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation have established the first ever cultural respect easement in New York State and the first one granted the Mohican Nation so that every citizen of the Mohican Nation forever has the right to come and use this land. And that is hopefully a model of what shared sovereignty can look like uh, for others. We gave nature a veto power within our bylaws. And so we have to consult nature before we do things just like um, you know, in New Zealand with the rights of rivers and many other communities have done. So we wondered, you know, if, if, if one small farm, if all we could do is feed our community, Dainu, right, that would be enough. But we started to wonder, you know, can a difference be made, a cultural change? And it seems that cautiously optimistic that progress is being made, right? So right here on this farm, using these farming practices, we went from 2% organic matter to 12%, which for those who aren't scientists, <laughs> like these are pre-colonial levels or, of organic matter this is putting the carbon from the air back in the soil where it belongs right the the native biodiversity is coming back the invasive species are reducing right we see in a time of, of covid to winona's point that these industrial food system is completely inflexible 
It is so efficient and so rigid that it can't pivot. And yet here with our local networks of farms and local food system, there's huge adaptability. So neighbors are pitching in to make sure one another gets fed. Uh, we're able to ship sales online. We're able to shift to doorstep delivery. We can do pop-up markets out of the back of the van. And so people are making sure that everyone gets fed in the community and showing what resilient food systems look like. Um, we've now had thousands of new black and brown farmers trained and they're doing badass, incredible work all across the nation, like the Katatumbo, you know, immigrant queer owned farm co-op in Chicago, like the Ubuntu farm program in Georgia, working with, uh, with fibers, actually, with both uh, plant fibers and animal fibers to reclaim black people's relationship with that. Um, our alumni started the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, which is receiving gifts in the spirit of rematriation and reparations of land and giving them to um, indigenous nations in the Northeast and, and leasing to black farmers, right? And it's a black indigenous collaborative, which is not easy for those who know the history, right? Of the way that white settler colonialism has, has pitted people against each other, but healing those wounds. There's a reparations map that is, is funneling resources to black and brown farmers. And, and I think that the national conversation is finally starting to shift, right? I would have never dreamed in my wildest dreams 20 years ago that presidential candidates would be calling up farms in our network to say, you know, what needs to happen to fix the food system and how can we write legislation? It's just mind blowing, like major media outlets, you know, folks on the ground can talk about reparations without getting a twitch in their eye. You know, folks can talk about um, indigenous sovereignty and, and understand those, what those words mean. And I, I really believe that we're understanding that if we ignore racial justice, if we ignore the health of the earth, fundamentally, uh, we'll never be free. And, and I agree that this moment is a portal. Um, it's calling us toward ecological humility. It's calling us toward a solidarity economy. It's calling us to relocalize and reprioritize. Um, and we have a huge opportunity if you think about it like, uh, you know, I'm a biologist by training. So when you look at the history of the evolution of species, there's a, a concept called punctuated equilibrium where you sort of steady state and then this big cataclysmic event happens and then massive change and like, you know, flourishing of, of biodiversity and new forms that could have never been imagined, the advent of photosynthesis. And so I think we're in that moment, right? So it, it's not a fad to care about black lives. It's not a fad to care about growing your own food, but it's this uh, hardship that opens a portal where we can jump to another level um, as humanity. That's my prayer. So what I'll leave you with is, is I, I just think that um, all of us, whether we are African descendant or not, I think we all need to ask ourselves if we're willing to carry on those seeds, right? Whether they're braided in our hair or, or uh, sewed into our skirts, right? Um, how are we, are, are we going to carry on those seeds? Or are we going to let them die out? And uh, one of my favorite poets, Pablo Neruda said, this is translated from Spanish, pardon me if when I want to tell you the story of my life, it's the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, you both, uh, like I said, laid out the future I want to live in, and you're leading it and teaching it. So um, I want to give an opportunity uh, to ask each other a question. So Winona, do you have a question you want to ask to Leah? I, I like that, how you bring life back to the soil and grow that, you know, and so you've done a lot of that in your, in your, in your territory with all kind of different ways or that's just awesome. I like that. Yeah, thank you, Winona, for saying that. I have a wonderful colleague, um, Larissa Jacobson, we work here on the farm together. Um, she's Indigenous Chinese descent and she put it so well. She said, I think our job as farmers is actually to call the carbon and by extension, the life back into the soil uh, from its exile. And so it gives so me this really beautiful picture in my mind. Whenever I'm out there on the land, I'm asking myself, like, is this thing I'm doing, is it inviting that life, that carbon back into it? So practices like composting, mulching, no-till, cover crops, uh, perennial cover, uh, terracing, you know, these, these practices that are, are both ancient and uh, new in the, in the sense of, of people paying attention to them uh they're really all we need they're all we need to be able to feed ourselves and and the earth at the same time and it's just been beautiful i mean we have like blue herons and green herons flying by and 
these hawks circling overhead and all pollen, all these amazing pollinators. I, I really love this year. We had so many of the uh, hummingbird moths. They look like a hummingbird, but they're a moth, right? <laughs> And it's, it's such a blessing because when we came out here, we, we bought this property from a logger who had, there were deep scars, let's just say, all over the landscape. And there were no hummingbird moths or green herons. So year after year, watching the life be welcomed home is, is very satisfying, let's just say. I love that. I love listening to you talk about that, the, the soil coming home and... Uh... You know, I uh, I, th I was really, in I thought that was really interesting that you said that the tilling caused that carbon uptake. I bet it did, you know? I never really thought about that, like the historic trauma. I mean, I, I when I go around up here where I stay, like sometimes I was in Clearwater County, County and I thought, you st once had trees here, <laughs> you know, once had trees. And uh, just kind of like what restoration agriculture or restorative work looks like is so, you know, is, is so, uh, full, you know, brings back your heart, huh? Brings back your heart, so. Yeah, maybe Leah, you could say, um, because also um, what you're talking about, that's a way to really heal the climate change that is happening. And you, you said really quickly what they were. Maybe you could say just what are some of the practices? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, so everybody could just capture what that is when you can bring life into the soil. Yes, I will. I'm eager to ask Monona a question too, but I'll recap <laughs> that. So um, yeah, regenerative agriculture, which is a big fancy way of saying, you know, farming the way our ancestors taught us, uh, can capture carbon in the soil and industrial ag, which is very focused on heavy tillage, like turning the soil over and over, uh, causes those microorganisms to just burn up the carbon they eat it and then they, they release the CO2. And there's some very interesting, you know, literature and, and articles I can send for folks who are interested about that history. But, you know, if you, if you plant cover crops, those are, are plants that are alchemists that turn air into soil, like uh, clover and rye and, you know, um, if you if you don't till, if you uh, use compost and mulch, if you plant perennials, so woody things or things that come back year after year, you don't have to disturb the soil. Uh, rotational grazing, so having your animals help with your pest management and keeping weeds down rather than you know mechanical equipment. These are things that can trap. And there's all kinds of debate about you know how much it would take, but anywhere from 12% to 50% of the carbon we need to trap could be trapped in the soil, depending like which papers you like to read, so. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I was, uh, I mean, I, I really rankle when they call th that conventional agriculture and us, I mean, it's not conventional, it's like an aberration, you know, <laughs> it's like 70 years of bad agriculture after all of these years of like good agriculture. And so I think just like, you know, this narrative is so important. You know, and, and the fact that when on a worldwide scale, about 70% of the food that's produced in the world is produced by people who look like you and I. It's not produced by those those other guys, it's us. You know, we produce, I mean, I know we produce a lot of food at my farms and, you know, we just upped it significantly because of COVID. Because I was like, I don't know where that food's coming from, so let's just keep planting, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so we, you know, we're, we're st extended our seasons and sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, how long are we going to be at this, you know. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it, it is, it's just, you know, bringing life back. And um, yeah, so I like, I like your story. I know that in my, I have one field that it's in between these industrial ag fields is the same thing is, is that we put in uh, horse manure. People say you can't use horse manure. Well, I just call horse shit on that one. And then, uh, you know, we put in a bunch of, bunch of, you know, fish guts and stuff. And then that like in the, in the whole like desert, talk about, you know, a desert that those guys created. Ours is like all full of all kind of animals and stuff. It's super, you know, I like seeing everything come back and it sure does. I feel like life just wants a shot, you know? I mean, I feel like if you give it a little bit of seed, a little bit of love, you're gonna get something, you know? And, and so don't, don't underestimate how much life wants things, you know? So I really, I like hearing your, hearing your work there. That's good. All right, well, Leah, you get to ask uh, Winona a question. <laughs> oh my God, I have so many questions, but I want to just amplify that life wants to grow because that's something we'll tell you know, like novice gardeners and farmers who are very intimidated. It's like, well, remember the seed's whole yearning, right, is to become a plant. And so there's many right answers and you, you almost have to get in the way 
uh, to prevent it from manifesting its destiny. So um, no pun intended, that was bad. <laughs> Not manifest destiny. But my question for you, let's see, I have to ask the micro or the macro, I'll ask the micro question. So I imagine that you have an incredible amount on your plate. I imagine that as a farmer who's outside with your hands on the earth, um, as a person who needs to think about post-harvest, processing and markets, if you're marketing as a, as a person who's probably in, in incredible demand as a speaker and writer and probably gets a million inane emails all the time about asking like, what is the native perspective on this or that? Like, so how funny. are you? How are you? And how are you, what do you do to be okay? And like manage all of this because I just imagine you're under immense pressure to shine the light and lead the way. And um, that's a really, that's a sweet and interesting question. I mean, you know, so things changed and then I got really local, you know, and then nobody really called me because everybody was in crisis. So I just kind of stayed local. And I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, maybe I, you know, cause like where I live, like you could just like not go to town for a long time, you know? And so we like live in this little, like we, we you know, we live next to the Amish. And so like us and the Amish are all hanging out and you don't really need to go to town. Like I get my goat milk from them. I make cheese and stuff, you know, and we trade and we have a grand time, us and the Amish. So it's super interesting, kind of like that ev evolution from like have to go to town, have to get on a plane, have to go to not going anywhere, still not going anywhere. You know, so my life is now like within about 20 miles. Although today I drove for two hours to go see this really interesting farm equipment manufacturer, you know. But I've been looking like in Europe for this equipment. I was like, hmm, looks like they make it here. Yep. Um, you know, or someone figured it out, like these old dudes. So I, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, now I'm trying to learn like the way of the Zoom, you know, and I'm trying to learn the way of these things. And if they, you know, and so that has helped me because now I realized like a couple weeks ago, I taught in New York. I was like a visiting professor at Brooklyn College. I had the most fun. I was like going back to New York team, you know, and so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that adaptation and I like it, although you got to switch your brain around a little bit, you know, um, you know, because you're in the field and you're all crusty, like you were just, we were just talking about, and then you're coming in and you're like, oh, I guess I just got to make sure my face is okay. Um, but, you know, and I think everybody is experiencing that, right? And then I'm just kind of, you know, you know, because you farm, like those of us who farm and grow foods, I mean, I've been, been a member of Slow Food and we got the indigenous slow food award and you know and i'm the slow food award for our uh, protection of wild rice and then i'd be like why do you have your conference at the end of october i'm not done harvesting yet you know what i'm saying it's like why do you have conferences like when farmers are still in the field it's like hard you know so that has changed because now i'm like and what i noticed which is what you noticed is that like a time or a digital thing that used to matter but when you're on your land it matters if it froze or if it didn't or if the maple syrup is running or it isn't if the corn is ripe or you know you change your clock right and then i have hard time like adjusting because like i'm on this other clock now and so like i get impatient with people i'm like why do you want to talk to me no i'm busy you know so i'm working on that you know, because now I'm like way more in my community than I was before, which is great. You know, some people are not too happy about my 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 localization, <laughs> but I'm like, that's I'm sorry, y'all multinationals who moved in, we're done. You know, so I'm just balancing it and trying to winnow through it, literally. And I'm not the best. You know, I'm trying to get the electronic systems up a little better so that people don't need to ask me. But then I work with a team like you do, right? That's how you get cool stuff done is I got like a, you know, you saw that farm picture. I mean, I got all these kids and I have a couple women that came in as volunteers and someone else showed up and she's raising pigs. And I don't know, I think I'm kind of like running a sanctuary for, for you know, people who are trying to like get out of the city and be farmers. And I'm like, come on, come on, give it a try, hang with us. So that's kind of how I adapted as people came and like they seem to show up. You know, they seem to come and that's, I mean, I'm praying that, you know, we manifest this one and that one. And then now my biggest challenges are like, I didn't expect to have these kids. And so I'm not really funded for the kids. 
And so I'm trying to figure out like what piece of what program I could kind of patch that together. So what are you going to do about the 25 kids or there's 60 of them that are out of school right now in my village? You know, they had a rotation and they have no other programs for those kids. So I try to take them in the fields and stuff. But like, you know, that's the biggest challenge I have is, is that the transition of resources to a place, you know, because I didn't imagine that I would be homeschooling or like coordinating school programs from, from these school districts. I homeschooled my younger kids. I mean, my, my kids, but my kids are in their 30s now. So I was like, oh, yeah, you know, how do we do that? But thankfully, there's these resources. That's, that's really my biggest challenge. And then, and then really just, you know, staying probably like you, you know, because all this other stuff is interesting. But, you know, did the tomatoes get big? You know, I got a lot of tomatoes. Like, did we finish with the tomatoes yet? You know, those are questions you ask when you're farming. I was like, oh, my God, there's some more tomatoes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Right? I'm sure, do you have the same thing too? It's like there's the people who are over there that you used to go see, and then there's like the tomatoes that are right here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking right now at the tomatoes that need to be harvested, and um, <laughs> we, we save seeds, so I need to do some seed fermentation and make sauce with the leftover part. Yeah, that's beckoning. <laughs> Aaliyah, I want to hear your macro question. Um, you said you had a macro sure. question. Sure. Well, here's the thing. And I, I mean, I hope it's evident that I completely agree with you, Winona, that um, we need to localize and regionalize in terms of our economies and, you know, even our social networks to a, to a degree. And I'm curious how you answer the challenge that often comes of, you know, how are you going to scale that up? Or how is that efficient or, or, or productive enough or feasible? And I'm, I'm just curious how you navigate that uh, capitalist assumption that bigger is better and you know advocate for this worldview that I, I align with. Well yeah I mean I think that um, so I just take the like I kind of take my region because I get the region pretty well and so I'm like I'm the northern plains and I have like all of this potential for hemp and buffalo. I'm taking futures in hemp and buffalo you know, put some more wind turbines up, manufacture some solar panels, and you have a regional economy, you know, so it's localized, but with regional, it's like a, you know, and, and you know, there was this great political leader named Louis Rial, he was a Métis, and he was the, uh, you know, elected to the, as a member of the provisional parliament in Manitoba, and then hung for treason a couple years later, because he was a little dark, but his ideas were, were salient, like, how do you build a multiracial democracy in our region, that was his question. You know, and that's what I think is getting revisited now because that border is really arbitrary. So I'm looking at, in my community, I'm looking at, I got a railroad that goes through my community and down here and like railroads cross a lot of Indian reservations. So I'm looking at this idea of solutionary rail, which is this really visionary idea of electrifying the trains first, which would be like visionary in first place, but then also using them to, you know, powering them on renewables. And then, you know, using them to move things because as you transform from a pot petroleum, you want to move to electric, right? And so I'm looking at like what my region would like be, be like, you know, if, you know, as, you know, because I'm working with a bunch of tribes who are interested in hemp and we aren't going to produce it all on my reservation, but how do you build a regional economy? And, you know, some of us have, you know, we got rice, those guys don't have rice, but they got buffalo, we could grow hemp, they could grow hemp. They might do this and that. So I'm looking at, you know, I refer to it as the new green revolution. Actually, hemp is the new green revolution. And I, and I claim that because Norman Borlaug came from the University of Minnesota and gave us the last green revolution. So I'm like, well, how about the people who didn't go to the U in Northern Minnesota give us the next one, you know? And to me, that's this hemp. It has this revolutionary possibility. And I feel like we can be, we could lead in the revolution in our region. And so that's like, that's enough for me. Everybody else could do their own gig, but you know, I mean, we all need to do parts of it, but I'm saying this is like, I see a regional economy that has national and international implications, you know? That's kind of my vision. And, you know, at the same time, you know, making sure that people got food locally. So it is, it is scale, but some things are bigger. Like, you know, for hemp, I think it's really interesting to do like, kind of like, I, I've done Japanese style hemp process. I've done like all of this hand and this, but I was like, you want to be a revolutionary and make canvas, you got to have big equipment. You know, so knowing what your scale is and what you're doing, you know, we all learn from that, you know. So anyway, that's kind of my, I don't have an easy answer on that. But I, you know, people want, people also want like this, I don't want to say the silver bullet because that's all military and it's, but they want the single pill. They want the one answer and there's not one answer. 
You know, we all got a, we got a lot of brilliance, but the biodiversity of our land and our water is also what determines what you're going to do there. You know, and that's what America hasn't listened to. They've been trying to figure out how to, you know, do stuff that they think they should do. And, you know, like, why would you cut down maples when you could have sugar? Why would that make any sense, right? You know, if you understand what you have, you're better, you know, but what a good opportunity, I feel like, you know, I just feel like this is this pandemic as portal. I'm like, things are falling apart. I'm going to feed my community. We're going to get some renewables up here, you know, and, and, you know, but, and you and I know that across North America and around the world, I mean, you just got to look at that really great book. I love that book, Drawdown, right? I mean, look at how many people are doing cool things, right? You know, we're just some of them. And I just like breathe that in. You know, you go see those guys and women and they're like, wow, that's cool too. That's a good thing. We're all out here doing it, huh? you know? Thank you. I, One I book to add to that is All You Can Save, which just came out and it's all women authors, mostly people of color that talks about climate mm -hmm. solutions. So, and youth are in there with their voices. It's just, just so all you can save. Definitely check that out because um, we need to make sure that that the women and folks of color get get their voice too. I like Lanny Kotler's question about renewables after that planet of the humans. I wrote him a letter, but I don't know where it ever went anywhere. You know, because Michael Moore, he needs a hug or something for Christ's sake. That guy is just like so sad and angry all the time. Can't say anything like, you know, he needs, he needs to like, well, that's like the white male problem, you know? He needs to like see some other stuff. Like I get what he was saying. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That Planet of the Humans, that film, it was really discouraging. It's like renewables, everything's a sham. Well, there's a lot of things that were not accurate in his end, but also it's about scale. It's about consumption. It's about like really figuring out what we're doing and like how many of those cell phones did you really need? You know, it's about really just cutting our stuff back, making stuff sustainably and making less of it, you know? And so to me, that's, that's a little bit of the answer. And then figuring out, like, I think a lot about, you know, I know it sounds crazy and y'all do this already, but you know, like energy consumption per household. I got all these kids and I was like, I'm gonna get a bike. This is my goal in the next month, get a bike set up so they can power their cell phones off of it. Like go power your own damn cell phone, right? I mean, thinking about this relationship between energy and consumption is really important. And there's a lot of things that need to be like, rebuilt and rescale because why the hell would you go to a gym, you know, without powering the gym on your own, you know, pedal power? What? It's just dumb stuff, you know? I don't know. I'm kind of rambling, but my point is, is that there's a lot of opportunities here. Well, that goes back to um, the, Leah's question, I think, Leah. Um, I find when I'm talking about the war economy and the peace economy is that, that you're creating the solutions, like the, the, that, what they're asking for already failed. And I just say, it's already failed. We have to find new solutions and be creative. And it will grow as necessary. The vacuums will show up, the needs will show up, and then we can answer them with the new, new patterns and new ways of thinking and new commitments. Like you have such beautiful commitments that um, grow out of soul fire, which goes to the question um, about education. There's a bunch of questions that have come out about how do we teach this? And I, Leah, I heard you say like something like a couple of thousand have come through so fire and you're already watching the seeds grow. Maybe you could talk a little more about how do you educate this? And, and that would be the scaling, I would think. Yes, and I love how you ended that question because one of the ways we respond when folks particularly talk about, well, if you have a long waiting list or there's so much work to do, why don't you just get bigger, bigger, bigger and franchise or something? And, and we push back and say, you know, the forest doesn't franchise, right? So the forest, if there's a, a grandmother pine who's getting lots of sun because she's on the forest edge, she'll take that extra photosynthate and dump it down into a network of fungal mycelium and feed it like to the other trees because that's how they coordinate their masting. That's how um, they share messages of warning uh, with one another, they, they trade minerals, they, they trade sugars. And so when we think about growth and scale, I really think it needs to be a translocal approach that's about supporting one another to grow locally adapted solutions in our own microclimates or bioregions, so to speak, um, where we are sharing ideas, we're sharing resources, but we're not um, like overshadowing, you know, through these, these big conglomerates. So all that to say, 
you know, there is an ethos in the black community called each one teach one. And, uh, you know, not exclusive to the black community, but there's this, this idea that once you know something, you're immediately obligated to share it with somebody else. That's part of learning. Um, that's part of how knowledge gets passed on. So, you know, from the moment we'd opened Soul Fire Farm, we had the youth programs, we have a week long uh, adult training that's residential, that's 50 hours of instruction, we have season long apprenticeships, so all these models. But I think what, when you say like how to teach, I, I really believe that contextual and experiential learning is, is strongest, you know, and of course, in a time of COVID, we adapt. So we have our Zoom class we did last night on mushroom cultivation, you know, the Zoom class we did last week on seed keeping. We adapt as best we can and we show people around, but it's not the same. So folks actually come to the land and are spending, you know, half or a little more than half of their day doing the techniques. So whether it's, you know, making a raised bed or a terrace, whether it's uh, saving that tomato seed we were talking about, planting a milpa with intercropping of corn beans, squash, whatever the things are, you're doing it and, and we're explaining the why and the how. And then, you know, we also have time to do uh, culturally relevant circle learning. So um, an example of this is, you know, I gave you a very brief version of the histories of uh, BIPOC folks' relationship to land. And so we have a class that we do where um, New Orleans funeral style, right? We gather around a fire. We have these ropes where we've put pieces of paper with these different harms that happened to our people in history. And we take turns like reading them, chanting them. We have music and then we release them to the fire. We release them not to forget them, but to release the hold that it has on us. Like that inherited generational trauma that tells us we're small, that we can't, right? So we have a ceremony and, and, and we're learning history. So that's an example of a type of workshop that's like rooted in our culture, also transmitting information that you might learn in a classroom. So it's, you know, out to the field, harvest blueberries, back inside, we have song circle, you know, out to the field, we're going to mulch the maize, you know, back inside, and uh, we're going to do ceremony because we're preparing to kill chickens, and whenever you take a life, there's uh, spiritual preparation, so, so that's what it looks like, and I have to say, as a science person, I was really um, looking at these evaluations and hoping somebody would be really excited about, like, my soil chemistry class, but, you know, by and large, what people are taking away uh, in addition to the concrete knowledge is this trauma healing. I mean, almost everybody is saying, I, I now see what freedom uh, feels like, tastes like. I now know that I don't have to settle for the bullshit, that, I, that I, my life matters, you know, that I can, I can make my dreams come true, that I can love with my whole heart. And so I think there's a very, very, that, that contextual learning is not just about like, how do you transplant? But it's also like, how do you come home to yourself? And uh, and that's why even though this work is hella hard, like we keep going because we see thousands of times over and over and over again, the power of this, this healing that happens when you learn on the land. Um, so farming is liberation. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, there is a question for both of you that's coming up a lot. And it's, what does the concept of solidarity economy mean to each of you in concrete terms? Um, so maybe, um, Winona, why don't you start? Yeah, I, you know, I think I'm, we're making it where we live and I'm kind of like looking at it and I, I think I'm building a multiracial food system. You know, I didn't really have the plan, but like as I got localized and then pretty soon, you know, I'm, I mean, we grow some things, we're good with the corn and the rice and the, you know, vegetables, but, you know, but then um, when I, when I, uh, you know, basically relocalized with the Amish, that was a really interesting relationship you know and so we you know we're, we're horse people too and so also to echo what you're saying leah i got a lot of horse therapy work that goes on because i have all these youth that are like and really come from like some messed up stuff let's just get real and i'm like look how happy that kid is on a horse you know and they forget all about how messed up things are and then they get to farm with horses and you know so you can see how i ended up with all these kids moving in you know and so I, I feel like that, so we're part of it. And then our Amish people, our neighbors, they're like the dairy part, right? It's super interesting. And then I've been studying the scale and technology issues because everybody like Wendell Berry, everybody's always talking about like, how is the production on the farm, Amish farm? And why do they make this technology choice? And why do they make this social choice? And, you know, so we're really in this interesting relationship with, a, with about six or seven of these Amish farmers and our kids and we they borrowed our horses and 
you know, so, I, you know, and, and then my kids went down there and helped them with the hay and, you know, it's super interesting. And then now people are asking me about weathers from the cities, weathers are male goats that you're going to eat. So I was like, looks like I'm going to start trying to figure out how to get the Amish goats to the Somalis. That's what I'm going to do. Right. How fun is that? You know, building like this multiracial food system with you know, like now you got the Somalis and the Hmong farmers came up and asked us if they could farm on some of our land. So I don't know what this solidarity economy is looks like, but that's what I think it looks like. Is you start with this, you know, this this set of like relations that keeps growing, and then um, and then what we do is we also you know and then I'm selling like my bulk of my large production I'm selling to the sous chef. Or he, you know, he's an indigenous chef in the cities and he just opened up a new store and he's like, Leduc, you got some stuff. I was like, oh, I got so many potatoes. Oh my God. You know, so, you know, I'm building this economy that's, you know, providing food now to people in the cities already, you know, and we're going to scale that up. But, you know, that's what I think it looks like because some of the re revenue is they have the money in the cities, but they can't grow. And I'm going to use that money to kind of recapitalize our work here and keep growing out, you know, our economy. And so I'm envisioning kind of this regional multiracial economy and I'm seeing it grow. And then, you know, we're producing the energy pieces cause we got the solar and we're, you know, those are mostly in the Indian community now but it's pretty soon those guys will catch on. You know, they just, you know, there's a lot of Indian hating up here. And so they gotta like be, I don't know, Indians are, I mean, I fought, I tried to be, run for a rural electric co-op board and I got shot down, ran on renewable energy, I mean, you know, jeepers! I didn't. They didn't even have to know that I was a person of color. They could have. <laughs> My point is, is like this kind of a struggle to work through, but we're we're doing it. You know, I'll, looking at those things of housing, food, medicine, energy, all of those. There's a lot of local elements that you could kind of rebuild. So, thank you, Leah. Yeah, I mean, I shade all that, which is like a affirmation in Yoruba. So there's a, a concept um, called Ujama. It's a, a West African concept of cooperative economics. It's one of the Kwanzaa principles for the African American to celebrate. And the, the fundamental assumption of cooperative economics is that the goal of the economy is not to screw people over, right? The goal of the economy is to make sure that goods and services get to those who need them. And it's relational. Um, you know, one of the ways that it shows up tangibly uh, in our life today, you know, comes out of the work of, of Booker T. Watley, who I, I mentioned really briefly, a, a black farmer at Tuskegee in the mid-1900s, who was noticing that when black farmers in the South were participating in the industrial food economy, where they grow just a, a cash crop like cotton or um, sugar, and then try to sell it to a middle person and, you know, if they could get any price at all for it, they were getting really low prices, they were being uh, discriminated against, they just weren't making it, and, the, and they're destroying their soil as they go. So Watley said, you know, I have this idea that's really ancestrally rooted, what if instead we do diversified horticulture? So everyone's not growing one crop, they're growing like 50 crops or more. So they've got sweet potatoes, they have goats, they have apples and pumpkins and all these different things. And he said, I also have an inkling that, you know, city folks are yearning for this connection to the country because this urbanization is happening. So what if you allow people to be members of your farm and for your membership fee, you get a newsletter with news and updates, right? Um, you get a chance to come to the farm and pick your own food. Uh, you get a you know, discount off of what would be the retail price and you build a relationship with a farmer over the season. So this probably sounds familiar because the CSA came out of this or community supported agriculture, which is an example of cooperative economics where there's a group of people who say, I commit to this farmer and the farmer is saying, I commit to this group of people over the long term. It's not like, which is the cheapest tomato today? It's like we have a, a, a relationship. We have an agreement uh, where we're holding each other up. And I think that we can look at that at a micro example and then kind of scale it out and say, well, what would it look like to not assume the economy is about getting the cheapest thing or screwing people over or winning, but it's about making sure that goods and services are distributed. And, and you see very quickly that it needs to be relational. Uh, we need to know, you know, you need to know who's that electrician, you need to know who put the solar panel in, you need to know who grew the food and, and how that water came out the ground um, and whether it's clean because your friend tested it. And so uh, this is what I envision. I envision something that's not racial capitalism, that is really returning to 
the dokwe, the susu, right? These ancestral ways of, of sharing the resources that the earth has, has lent to us. You know, Leah, I could probably take some notes on that kind of organizing, you know, because people want to come and I don't have it set up really yet. And now during COVID, but we're doing this workshop on, on hempcrete and I really want to try to get some training so they're masking up and they're outside and it's a nice day. But, you know, there's so many people from the urban area that just like, particularly now with COVID, just really want to see life, you know. I get all kinds of people and, you know, figuring out a way to make like, you know, like somebody who's like, we're, we're 200 miles from the city, you know, so it's not like you could be quite the member, but you know, I, I, I could really learn, we could learn from some kind of models of, of support for, you know, this and, and um, thanks for inspiring me, you know, also in that. Likewise. Yeah, I'm learning so much from this and we have a long way to go. But yeah, we have some rural members too. But the idea is like a subscription, you know, you sign up at the beginning and you say, here's my commitment. And then there's sort of a package of things you get, harvest of the land. And I really like the CSA because it, it means we have zero waste. Um, not that we would waste anyway, but it's very stressful sometimes. Like say you grow all these tomatoes and you don't know where they're going. And so you're hustling and trying to can all day or whatever but with the csa everything is already like my my families my 50 families i know who they are and i know what they eat and i grew the food for them and i'm going to bring it to them as it comes through you know what i mean so yep. it has also helped me in that way because when i wasn't doing that i would get very stressed about um you know trying to prevent waste <laughs> so. yes there's never the, the questions and the answers keep rolling <laughs> yeah, i'm looking at them yeah. So we're, we are getting to the end. Um, so um, one of the things that both of you are doing, I mean, from my vantage point, we live in a war economy and um, to create a peace economy, you are both doing that. And Leah, you spoke to it about how people come to learn to farm, but they really learn the culture of liberation and, um, and we culture themselves. So um, <laughs> how, um, in in you know as we as we finish how 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 do you see culture playing you know how do we reculture ourselves and divest from the violent economy and reinvest ourselves if we if we don't have a farm um and how do we um ourselves live by the principles that you both uh, live your lives out of that Everyone is just so inspired by them. The you know the the love is flowing in in the in the in the comments. Um, so if you could just leave us with um, a little of like what what can we do? And um, when well, I'm going to start with you, and um, um, well then we'll finish with Leah. Right. And I'm looking at the chat and do you know please I'm going to put my email on there. Definitely follow up. You know I'm super interested in a lot of these things. So you know. My, um, I, I really resonate, of course, with Leah's work. You know, and my focus is really how do you re-indigenize our, our, our economy? You know, and I, and, um, you know, so we have a lot already because we, we have biodiversity and we have rice and fish and, you know, maple syrup. And we, we live where the creator put, you know, instructed us to go and it's good. And so, you know, my interest has always been in kind of the, the, the rematriation, you know, and how you be, begin to recover all of that so that we become the full people again. And so, you know, from our perspective, like Leah was talking, we, you know, we always put out, offer our food up for our ceremonies, you know, and people are so appreciative. And I, you know, we use tobacco for a lot of our ceremonies. I grow a lot of the tobacco for those ceremonies, you know, at our farm. And in that way, you kind of like, you know, our food and our work, and our horses too, we use them, you know, we need to use them more, but they go for a lot of our, you know, some of our ceremonies, but we, um, we, we just have this, uh, you know, way to just pour back in the things that were took out into and, and nurture, you know, our community. And I feel really, you know, people are really good. You know, my focus is really on tribal, tribal communities in my region, but really great residents. And if you just look across North America, you know, some Mi'kmaq seed seeders, seed gardeners just contacted me, said, can you come chat with us? I was like, sure, girls. You know, I mean, everywhere, there are people that are doing this, you know? 
and uh, there's this resurgence of that connection between farming and people and and I think that you know it's beautiful and there are more growing every day so I've been really inspired by indigenous seed keepers Rowan White I mean come on there's like the best seed keepers out there now and I'm just grateful that I know these young women that are that are taking over these a lot of this work so well, there you go. Pour back in what was taken out can happen anywhere. <laughs> so, um, Leah, um, if you could share. Well, first of all, do whatever Winona tells you to do and support <laughs> her work. I would say that is, that is the way forward. I mean, and we have this concept of, of remembers. So we think of in every generation, right? There's going to be at least that handful of people that haven't forgotten those original ancient instructions of how we are to be in right relationship with the lands and people and the sister right here uh, Winona is a rememberer uh, for sure and so we need to be um, really heeding that wisdom. I think additionally you know to build off of this concept of lands I think it's a, a grave atrocity that almost all of the arable land in this country is, is owned by colonizers so we need to actually give that lands back so rematriation of lands meaning literally handing over title and doing that on the terms of, of whose ever land you're on and, and different um, tribal communities have different ways they want that to go, uh, but, but working really actively to return the land. Um, I think also uh, reparations for uh, black people and uh, people who have been, whose labor has been exploited in this capitalist system. There's many trillions of dollars of stolen wealth that needs to be returned, you know, like right now, in this country, you know, when a, a white child takes their first breath, they're 16 times wealthier on average than a black child, and, and they weren't doing financial literacy in the womb, right? This is because of inheritance of, of stolen wealth. And so how do we redistribute so everyone has a fair shot to own a home, a business, to um, educate their children, to eat, right? Um, and I think also I would, I would say the local mutual aid, you know, the stuff that popped up in COVID in a lot of communities where people are getting groceries for each other, growing their own food, uh, checking in on each other. Don't let that be uh, just the, this moment. We need to be um, waking up to who's around us and supporting one another. And then the final thing I, I had mentioned, ecological humility, which is a, a, a fancy way of saying, uh, tuning our ears to listen to the earth and to what she's telling us to do. And she's screaming right now and still some of us aren't listening. So figuring out how to, to open up those channels. So we are again, following the instructions of our mother uh, because she would like us to survive. And uh, unfortunately we're on a suicidal track. So we need to, we need to smarten up and listen to our mom and, and get in line and, and do what we need to do to, to stay here on this beautiful earth. Thank you. Um, so the other thing that's just flowing like crazy is people want to know how to support you. Um, so if each of you could talk about how that can happen. Um, Winona. Is that better? Um, you know, so you can support us through our supporting our work at Anishinaabe Agriculture. I'll put that up here. And we do have a nonprofit. And then um, we're known as hemp is all our is also our farming work. You know, I mean, I spend a lot of time on um, pipelines, but I used to just do land trust work. <laughs> and and um, so please just follow up with us. And then just, you know, keep I mean, everything you do in your community is the same thing, like support local farmers there. And then look at this hemp thing, because this is um, this is the new green revolution, and you want to be a revolutionary. So keep an eye on us up here, because we're going to get this down, and you want to be part of the revolution. So yes, and the um... so I love that folks want to support. I really appreciate it. Our website is soulfirefarm.org, soulfirefarm.org, and you can definitely you know donate, volunteer. But we also, I want to say, um, are real careful about what we call the hero industrial complex, where you know a lot of attention sometimes gets to the person who's the, the good storyteller or who happens to be picked up by the media. So we also list out, you know, hundreds of other organizations, including Winona's, on our website under Take Action, that are Black, Indigenous, um, Latinx, and Asian-led that are working on these. So um, I also encourage you to take some time to just look at that list and say, oh, who's near me that I maybe didn't even notice was doing this? And if you have resources to share, share it, because it's really all of us together um, 
you know, doing very similar overlapping and complementary work that needs support, and it and it's very underfunded, very undersupported. So, thank you for that. Um, and also, you mentioned reparations, Leah, and that they're happening. Um, is there a way to find that out on your website? Because um, I think you know you both do this so well by taking complex ideas and making them super relational. And I think, you know, reparations used to just be this abstract notion that people wanted to do but couldn't figure out how. And you mentioned that that's happening and I'm wondering um, if you could say how people who want to Absolutely. participate. Absolutely, yeah. So a little asterisk, like, we definitely adhere to the United Nations definition of reparations, which has five parts and it's done at a societal level. So I'm in no way letting the US government off the hook for truth and reconciliation, for massive transfer of resources. And I know if we can't even pass HR 40 to study reparations, it's gonna be a while. So we have this people to people giving in the spirit of reparations. And there's a map also on our website, if you go to undertake action reparations, and it's a searchable like Google map and you can see black indigenous led projects around the country that have decided to list themselves on this map. And then they put a listing of what they need. And um, so I definitely encourage you to, to check that out. And uh, when giving in a spirit of reparations, it really is a no strings attached gift that acknowledges that the wealth that we, we have isn't really rightfully ours to own and that it's a blessing to return it. So that is the, the spirit that we ask that giving be done uh, in the reparations map. Well, that goes back to the stewardship of the land, which is really, you know, at the core of the Schumacher Center. Um, and the land trust work that is really picking up for the the team there of people really getting that uh, you know the original sins are genocide and slavery and the privatization of land so um, that how could we learn that to be stewards would be a, a big big step forward so I want to thank you Winona and Leah for joining us and for all you do to nourish the world of regeneration, liberation, justice, and peace. This year will mark the 40th anniversary of the EF Schumacher Lectures. It'll be the first year the lectures are held virtually, so we're in practice mode. Um, George Monbiot of The Guardian in London and Kelly Acuno of Cooperation Jackson are speakers on October 25th. We hope you can join us, and until then, do all you can to cultivate your local peace economy and regenerate life. Thank you. Thank you, Miigwech. Thanks, everyone. Peace and blessings.